Wed weddings are complex. I, I've performed quite a few ceremonies over the year, and uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, there's no one part of a wedding that is uh, necessarily difficult, but it's the fact that there's so many little things that need to be done that come together in that one shining moment where uh, we have a ceremony, uh, it becomes rather nerve-wracking. So uh, there's, there's a lot of things that are being done today to help folk be prepared and organized for a wedding. Uh, there's lots of books out there, uh, wedding planners and organizers. Uh, you can even get an app uh, or two for your phone. Uh, there's some free downloads that you could have to help plan for uh, the big day and the ceremony, and it kind of outlines what needs to be done where, et cetera, and so forth. And uh, in fact, if, if you wanted to spend some extra money, you could hire somebody to be a wedding, uh, wedding planner for you, and they, they take care of all the details. Uh, in fact, uh, I once uh, was involved with a wedding where there was a planner and everything moved like clockwork. This woman was running around, she had a tablet in her hand, one of those earpieces. She was going around, it, it was like the orchestration of a, of a major league, uh, you know, baseball game or football game or something like that. They were just, you know, everything was just precision, uh, spot on, you know, uh, in terms of who was where doing what. And um, uh, so, so the details of a wedding are, are very significant. In fact, uh, uh, I know one pastor who uh, would actually carry a toothpick with him when he went to uh, perform a wedding ceremony. And I thought that was the craziest thing in the world. You know, why would he even have a toothpick tucked away uh, right in his uh, little folder with his uh, his notes and the like? And he said, well, when, when the... Uh, uh, the ring bearer sometimes comes down, you know, the, the kids, they have the pillow with the uh, the wedding rings on the pillow. They, they tie them very tightly to them. And uh, not many people do that uh, now, but, but some still do. And sometimes that knot is so tight, you can't get it undone. <laughs> so he has that toothpick. So, so you got to think through all these different things uh, when we think about a wedding in preparation for it. And Paul, believe it or not, is like the ultimate wedding planner. Uh, he understands... And one of his goals and objectives is to present the church before the groom, Jesus, prepared and ready for their wedding supper of the Lamb. And as we head into this pericope, this prayer in 1 Thessalonians, it has a wedding theme to it. Because Paul's prayer really comes in three parts, and then we'll have a few applications. It's short. But it's very potent in that Paul is thinking ahead. He's got this little church in Thessalonica, not a lot of people. They've just been together for a few weeks, and Paul wants them to be ready. He wants to prepare them, just like we would think through in, a, in wedding language here, so that they are ready to meet their groom. And uh, this is where we pick things up in verse 11. It tells us this. Paul's prayer. Now may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. And we'll stop right there because uh, there's quite a bit. We have uh, a three-part prayer and then we'll have some application to follow. The prayer involves unification, affection, and sanctification. As Paul is now uh, revealing his heart, really, to the Thessalonians, he is essentially saying that he is praying that God would bring them back together again. This is very important. Uh, Paul has been detained. Uh, we don't know the specifics, but we know that uh, he attributes that uh, separation to Satan's uh, buffeting of his desire. Uh, that's why he sends Timothy, and we learned that earlier on. Uh, but Paul sees that he needs to be back in contact, in fellowship with this specific church. Uh, and what that brings us to is really a scripture verse here uh, that is very potent, uh, that applies to this, this type of a setting. It's from Hebrews 10.25. Uh, Not forsaking your own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day drawing near. And this really has that same wedding language, that day of Christ coming near. Paul speaking about this here. They need to be together. Not just on their phones with each other, not just texting messages, not just on you know FaceTime, but they need to be in the same physical proximity. Why? Because Paul valued the fellowship. It was important. Coming together as a church, to kibbutz, if you would, as they would say in Yiddish, has intrinsic value 
to all of our relationships. We need to be together as a church family. And Paul understood that, and this was his prayer. This is what he was seeking. So he's seeking it on behalf of the fellowship, but he's also seeking it on behalf of worship. Because we need to come together to worship as a community of believers. Uh, it's not about the food. It's about the fulfillment of God's purpose and plan as we come together. And I know some of you are thinking to yourselves, that is Baptist heresy right there. But, uh, but I'm, I'm serious when I say this. The, the idea here is, is we need to come together for the purpose of what? Of growing as a church family. It's God's design. Now think about it. You think about it in, in, in a relational light. You know, when I, when I met my wife, I didn't just sit there and say, oh, you know, I really think you're a nice person, and I'll just talk to you on the phone. I'll just send you some letters. No, what did we do? We went out. We went to dates. We, we went and did things. We spent time together. We went for walks and picnics, and we had meals together. It's part of getting to know one another, and it's critical. And Paul saw that. He realized that that communication, that interaction, was an essential component to their growth and his as they are being prepared for what? For the wedding. For the bridal supper of the Lamb. So this is the first point in, in terms of the Paul of prayer is for one of coming together. The second is one of affection. He tells us here in the passage, Now may our, our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us, plow out all the, whatever's, in, whatever's impeding him, so they can come together. May the Lord make your, your love increase and overflow for each other. <clears throat> and this is what we see him also writing uh, in the book of Philippians. Philippians 1.9 echoes a similar sentiment. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. And really when you get down to it, this idea of love, agape, affection, uh, this uh, unconditional commitment to one another is not stagnant. It's not meant to be stagnant. It's something that grows. It's something that's alive. It's, it's fluid. It moves. And, and Paul sees this here. And he understands that they need to grow in that love because really when you get down to it, when you put a bunch of people together who are sinners, what are they going to do? They're going to collide. And just imagine a room full of four-year-olds driving around bumper cars. Sooner or later, you're going to have a problem. And that's exactly what happens when we come together as a church. Each one of us is broken. Each one of us is busted. Each one of us is struggling. Each one of us has sinful, selfish in inclinations. And what are we going to do? We're going to plow into each other. We're going to say things that are off. We're going to say things that you know, upset each other. We're, we're, we're going to be uh, ignoring one another at times. And Paul understands this. And he says, you know, you, you've got to learn how to love one another. And this is his prayer. Not just to love one another in words, but also in deeds. And we see a similar reflection of that in Hebrews 13, 16. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So, so what he's gunning for here is the fact that he would like to see the church come together. He needs to be part of that. And he wants them to grow in their affection for one another. And, he, and, and this, is a, this is not something you do on your own. We need God's help every step of the way. That's why he's appealing to the Father and the Son. He's making a, a very unique appeal that God's sovereignty would rule in and Jesus would, would empower. And he's doing this because he understands that human nature is such that we rub each other sometimes a little wrong. <laughs> think, think about it in this light. We rub each other so much that we become calloused. Have you ever been out there and, and, and like you're working very hard and your, your hands, after perhaps swinging a hammer or an axe, working with wood or something, you, your hands get calloused. Now, now why is that? It's because of friction. You have a lot of friction on your hands and what ends up happening is it, it, there's, there's, your skin builds up so it doesn't peel and, and, and you don't get blisters. And that callousness, that, that friction creates is actually, to some degree, helpful for your hands, but it's not helpful for your heart. And that's why Paul is beseeching God's intervention, because he understands that we're going to rub each other wrong, and there's going to be friction. And that friction in life, whether it be in the workplace, or in the school, or in the home, or among siblings, or even in a church setting at times, that friction can create a calloused heart. And because of that, the love of us could grow cold. 
In fact, Jesus warns us about that as the end times approach, that there would be so much friction in the world, there'd be so much resistance, there'd be so much hatred, there'd be so much selfishness that the love of many would grow miserably cold. And this is why Paul is praying such a prayer, that that callousness would never put such a, a veil over the human heart that we would lose affection for one another or for reaching out to others. And because it needs to grow, because it needs to be fluid, because it needs to be constantly on the go, if you would, Paul sees that the Holy Spirit must be involved in the lives of God's people. A beautiful picture of what this looks like, really. If, if you've ever walked uh, right here in Newport, up on Clyde Street, you cross over the bridge and you walk up uh, toward the, the dam there. You have the Clyde River uh, flowing through. And then on the other side, uh, there, there's like this ridgeway. There's also another body of water. And uh, it, it's like this, it almost looks like a pond. It sort of parallels the river. And when you stand there, you look down the hill and you have this river. And it's filled with life and fish. It's teeming with salmon and perch and bass and trout. Uh, and it's just this vivacious place because there's this flowing water. But if you look to the other side of that ridge, there's this, this pond that's like this canal. And there's this rank, stanky water. And nothing's living in it. Everybody that's out fishing is over by the river where there's, there's this motion, there's this flow. On the other side, you see another body of water. There's not a fish in there. I'm not sure anything lives in there at all. And the difference, the contrast, is really a picture of, of believers. Those who are growing, those who are flowing, those who are seeking, those who are being nourished, those who are allowing God to, to move in their lives are filled with that life and that love. Those who are stagnant, just sitting in their pews, doing a whole lot of nothing, become stagnant and lifeless. And Paul is praying that that vitality might grip the church, and he's praying for that in his prayer. His third portion here, he has the unification, he has the affection, and then finally the sanctification. He says, may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy ones. Now he's talking about the coming of Christ here. This is why this is wedding language. This is why we're looking at this through the eyes of a marriage and the preparation for it. But notice here his prayer. He says, may... He strengthen you. That, that picture here in Greek is to set roots, to be established, to have a foundation, to be dug in so deep that nothing's going to move you. Earlier on, he talks about the fact uh, that they were uh, being unsettled by others. You know, the, 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 the tail of a dog wagging all over the place. He, he goes into the opposite direction here later on in the passage. And what he wants and he, what he prays for, what he's hoping for, is that there would this, this foundation would be established in such a way that the church at Thessalonica would grow and flourish and blossom and bear fruit for God's glory. And he mentions two things here, in, in holiness and in purity, and then finally to be blameless. The notion here of holiness and purity uh, really encompasses actions. It's the life you live. It, it, it's the positive things we do. It's going out and getting involved in other people's lives. It's, it's making the telephone calls. It's showing up at the hospital. It's doing the visits. It's getting involved with ministry. It's you know showing up and saying, you know, I'm going to make a pot of soup, or I'm going to uh, be there to help with the kids in nursery or Sunday school. It, it's, getting in, it's getting in the trenches and doing the work. And what we find here is that that those examples are what clothe us. It's part of the preparation. I want to go back to the passage that uh, Ken read for us a few moments ago from Revelation, just looking at two verses. The, the, the preparation for the wedding supper of the Lamb involves clothing, an outfit. Let us rejoice, it tells, and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And here's how that readiness is, is manifested. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is what? It's representative of what? The righteous acts of the saints. We are to be clothed. Part of our preparation our wedding gown, if you would, is what we do. It's not just the sentiments of the heart, but it's the actions that are manifested in the hands. 
It's the involvement we have in the lives of other people. And that is the preparation Paul is praying about and speaking of here. That as God's chosen people, as the bride of Christ, our preparation entails getting involved in the lives of others. Hence the need to come together, hence the need to love one another. The blameless issue here is to be free from accusation. He, he certainly understands we're not going to be perfect. But he also realizes that we need to be moving toward holiness. That there needs to be a heart and a mind that says, you know, every time I open my Bible and I see something that convicts me, I'm realizing maybe I'm acting a little too selfish. Maybe I'm acting in doubt. Maybe I'm acting in unbelief. Maybe I'm acting out of fear. You know, maybe I'm just, you know, proud. When I start to see these things cropping up off the pages of the scriptures, I'm not going to stop and make excuses for my behavior. I'm going to get on my knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I need your forgiveness. I need your help to, to root out some of this sinfulness so that I could lead a better life. That's a blameless person. We were just talking about that in Sunday school a few moments ago where David cried out, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence. But he goes on to say, Restore unto me what? The joy of your salvation. David had that broken and contrite heart. And this is exactly what Paul wants to see in the church today. People who are willing to change. People who are willing to grow. People are willing to take their baggage and leave it at the foot of the cross and find forgiveness and reconciliation and renewal and wholeness because that's part of our witness. That's part of our testimony. That's what the world sees. That old rascal that was running around is different today and that's how we are clothed in preparation for our groom. So what do we do with all this? Pray, pray, pray some more. It's an example of prayer, first and foremost. It's a prayer for ourselves. It's a prayer for our church family. It's a beautiful role model. It's a beautiful paradigm, a picture of how we could be praying for each other on a regular basis. I'd like, to, uh, I'd like you to t kindly turn with me, uh, and I don't have it up here on the screen. I want you to look at it right in your pew Bible. It's page 177. Grab your Bibles. He turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. I want you to see it right on the page and, and, and read it there with me. Hebrews chapter 10. Picking up in verse 23. We're only going to look at a few verses. Hebrews 10, 23. Page 177, if you're looking at the Pew Bible, tells us this. There's a series of short commands. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward what love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day, and this is the wedding language here, the coming back of Christ, the, reunif the unification of, of bride and groom, as you see the day approaching. There's our marching orders right there. Loving, encouraging, spurring, spurring one another on, staying together, rekindling that hope. And it's all founded on what? It's on the gospel. It starts with God's simple plan of salvation. It's rooted and grounded in the relationship that Jesus came to establish when he died on a cross and rose from the grave three days later so that we could find reconciliation with the Holy God. It is out of the context of that relationship which begins when we place our faith in him and him alone and trust that he will wash away our sin and renew us and refresh us and give us that relationship. Based on that, we become rooted and grounded in him and now we can put this passage into practice. So we need to start building better connections, relationships. What I want to do is encourage you, if you're not connected in some sort of a small group, to do so. Even if it's once a month, to come out and start cultivating and working on growing relationships with one another. It's absolutely critical. Number two, to develop affection for one another. That's what happens when we come together. We learn about each other. We grow together. We see the faults, yes, we see the bumps, we see the bruises, but we also see the life circumstances. We, re we, we, we develop a level of compassion for one another. 
Because we come to realize we don't have as much not in common as we think. That most of us are just struggling and limping through life and trying to figure out how to get, get by, just like the person sitting next to us. So we build those connections, we develop the affection, and finally, we work on growing together by serving and by seeing our own sin and saying, Lord, I need some work, I need some help, I need some accountability. And that's the preparation process that Paul is praying about. I want to give you a picture of what this looks like, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. This young woman by the name of uh, Chelsea Hill, she was a 17-year-old, and uh, she was in a horrible motor vehicle accident. Her har car was just completely wrecked, and uh, they found after they extracted her from the automobile that she suffered a spinal cord injury, and Chelsea was not able to walk from that point forward. She was confined to a wheelchair. Over the next several years, she strengthened her arms and, and became better at, at using her wheelchair. Um, and in that time period, she met a, a young man by the name of Jay. And they fell in love. In fact, they, they decided that they wanted to get married. So, so Chelsea and, and her, her uh, husband-to-be, Jay, began to put all the preparation and plans in place for their wedding. Uh, they found a, they were going to have an outdoor service. Uh, it was going to be uh, in a, almost like on a beach setting. And uh, there was a venue, a hotel nearby where they would have the reception. Uh, and they put all, all the pieces together, you know, the guest list and, you know, uh, the, uh, the flowers and, and uh, the, the outfits, the music, all, all the food, everything was coming together very nicely. But Chelsea decided to do something uh, very unique. And uh, she wanted to surprise her groom on that special day. It was her determination that she would walk down the aisle. She was in touch with her doctors, therapists, or somebody who made prosthetics. Never told Jay. It was all a secret. And in the months leading up to the wedding, as they were doing all the other preparations, she was getting therapy and having these special braces designed to fit over and encase her legs so that they could hold her up and allow her to have some level of mobility. She was also working out so that she could hold herself up. They, her doctors had designed a special walker for her so that she could like hold herself and be able to, to ambulate to a degree down the aisle. She made plans with the venue so that rather than uh, having the grass there in the lawn, they would put some masonite down and cover it so it was nice and flat and smooth and strong uh, so she wouldn't be able to trip. And then after they had developed uh, the prosthetics and, and got her walking and, and, and working a little bit in, in, a, uh, uh, in a setting, you know, at a therapist's place, her father came in and started to work with her because they knew he was going to need to help her to get down the aisle. So the father uh, of, uh, of, of the bride and, and uh, her, they, they tried for, for weeks so that when the wedding day rolled around, she could stand. It was her goal and her hope not just to walk down the aisle, but also to be able to stand for at least a portion of the ceremony so when she exchanged vows with her groom, she could look him right, right in the eye and stand by his side as they made a commitment before God and their, their witnesses. They went as far as redesigning and putting together a special dress for her because they knew she was going to have to sit during portions of the ceremony and during the reception. So they, they had a seamstress come and designed a dress that actually would be taken apart partially so they could get some of the floof out of the way so she could actually sit and not trip over things as well. All this preparation came together and finally, it was a couple of years ago, uh, they, uh, the, the wedding date rolled around. Jay was at the front with the minister uh, ready for this big moment and suddenly there she was standing with her walker a radiant bride prepared to meet her groom there wasn't a dry eye <laughs> she made it down the the aisle with her father had to sit through part of the ceremony and then when it came time to exchange vows she once again stood by his side prepared to be his wife. 
It was such a beautiful illustration of what God is doing for us right now. We are the bride of Christ. And he is preparing each and every believer and follower of Jesus Christ in ways that go beyond anything we can imagine. He's preparing us for that final day when we meet our Savior face to face. The wedding supper of the Lamb. The beautiful story about Jay and Chelsea is that uh, about a year and a half later, uh, they found out they were going to have a child. And uh, she's now a mom. And, uh, you know, God, God just, just blessed this, this relationship abundantly. But he's also blessing our relationship with him even more abundantly. And that is why Jude writes this. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray.